Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll get started. My name is Claude Cochini, and I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College and a Professor of Mechanical Engineering, actually. So this is my home. And uh, so this is our continuing series of celebration of faculty careers, which we started about three years ago as a result of strategic planning from the faculty to uh, give the opportunity to senior faculty, specifically for faculty who have been full professors for seven years or more, to get a chance to share with everyone, other faculty, staff, and students, their experiences and, and the journey they went through in getting to where they are. And uh, so uh, today, uh, uh, by the way, so once they get to give a talk, a colloquium like this, they get a chance to meet with the department head and the dean to talk about their plans for the next seven years. So today, we have the distinct pleasure of having Professor Ganesh Subarayan. He uh, received his PhD in 1991 from Cornell, and uh, he started his professional career actually at IBM Corporation. And then afterwards, he went and he was a faculty member at the University of Colorado, where he was an assistant and associate professor, and he came to Purdue in 2002. And we've had great pleasure of having him as part of our faculty. His research interests are in computational solid mechanics, computational geometry, and microelectronics reliability. He was actually a pioneer in using geometric models directly for analysis, uh, which is an area called isogeometric analysis. And so we are uh, so pleased to have him tell us about his own area. Thanks, Ganesh. Thank you so much, Claude. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Um, the way it happened, a uh, little bit of background, the way it happened was uh, sometime in fall, I got an email from Anil. And there were three phrases in that email that I couldn't ignore. One of them was, I strongly request your participation. I look forward to your response today. <laughs> No is not acceptable, <laughs> with N-O capitalized. So here I am giving the talk today. So it is really my pleasure. Um, thank you all for taking the time to come. I really appreciate it. I know many of my faculty colleagues are here, and I know your days are very busy, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come. And uh, I'll also introduce a couple of uh, distinguished friends here a little bit later. A um, little bit about myself, um, early education. I was uh, born in Chennai, Madras, which uh, the state government decided to rename to Chennai because they want to erase any vestige of colonialism, any colonial west. So they don't want any British given names there, so it became Chennai. And then uh, moved to Bangalore at age 12 to go to my eighth grade. Uh, moved to Bangalore, which is there. It's about 300 kilometers away, 320 kilometers away. And then uh, attended Indian Institute of Technology in Madras after the 12th grade. And during the five years I was there, I was going back and forth as that arrow showed quite often. And this is what, I don't know if uh, any of you have had a chance. I know some of you are from Madras and you know what Madras is like and some of you may have visited Madras. Um, especially if you're not from India, if you visit Madras. Madras is, like any other city, crowded, polluted. But IIT is, uh, literally looks like this even now. So you can see deer crossing. It's really like a rainforest. It's a very nice place. So I was very fortunate to have the chance to go there. And then I came to, after my five years at uh, IIT, I had the chance to come to grad school to do uh, to Cornell, and so I landed in uh, JFK. I landed in JFK and then took a short hop flight, a little plane, and it's all new experience to me. And driving through New York City, 
someone picked me up from the airport in JFK and dropped me back at JFK and everything seemed to go so much faster, everything seemed so much more organized, less noisy and it was a very uh, exciting experience I must say. So I took this short flight to Ithaca and this is the picture that typically people tend to have in the catalog and it looked exactly like that, spectacular, very beautiful. You can see the Kriga Lake in the background, clock tower and within walking distance within less than half a mile in almost inside the campus is a 60 foot waterfall, the Ithaca Falls and if you decide to go bike up seven, seven miles you can come to Taganak Falls which is 215 feet taller than Niagara not as wide but taller than Niagara and so spectacular place and this is the engineering quadrangle there was a sundial there and I was told when I landed in Ithaca that sundial was designed and built by Professor Richard Fellon who I knew from the book that he had written on machine, machine design. So here I was in the place where Professor Fellon worked and looking at the sundial that he had built. So it was a great experience. And this is the Upson Hall where uh, mechanical engineering is housed. And this ugly building didn't exist at the time I was a graduate student. It's been built since then. It's the Nano Center and they always look new. They were always built around mid-2000. So this one was no exception. That was built around mid-2000. So I, I went to, up, I was in Upson Hall and Professor Don Bartel was my PhD advisor. I was admitted to an MS PhD, MS slash PhD. Cornell always admitted all their students to MS slash PhD was one's choice, whether one wanted to pursue a PhD directly or to go through an MS. I chose to pursue a direct PhD by advice by Professor Bartel and Cornell also required us to do minors. I did two minors, one in computer science and another in solid mechanics and my major was in systems and design which is sort of a nebulous area at Cornell which lumped together a lot of different areas. And that little circle there was my office, that was a corner office and that was, that was where I spent five years. And the field that you see is a baseball field Professor Fisher is not here, Tim Fisher is not here, but that was probably where he was as a catcher in the baseball field. <laughs> okay. okay, and this is, uh, so in Cornell, you, you, three years that your advisor paid for your tuition, and uh, after that, if you passed what's called the A exam, which is the equivalent of our prelim exam, then you go on reduced tuition. So the advisor is even more anxious to get you on, pass the prelim exam or get you out of the door. To get you out of the get you out of Cornell one way or the other, because that puts you on a reduced tuition. So at the end of uh, three years, I had to go on take the A exam, and I passed the A exam. So I was on the PhD track officially at that point. But sometime before that, about six months before that, my advisor said, "Let's look at bone remodeling." And uh, um, you know, you have to. I have to give you a little bit of background about myself. In India, if you want to do engineering, the subjects that you need to, the, the marks that count towards your uh, engineering admission is your scores in physics, chemistry, and math. Biology is not counted, and I barely passed biology. And here it was with my advisor who's saying that I should do something on bone remodeling. There's a little bit of history to that, and the reason for that is my advisor had, um, I think, a third or a half-time appointment at Cornell Hospital for Special Surgery where he was designing the process prosthesis, custom prosthesis, so, and he would commute every week to New York City, so bone was something that we were very interested in, he wanted to know how custom prosthesis affected the bone around the prosthesis that indicated the success or failure of a surgery, a prosthetic surgery. So he wanted me to look at bone remodeling, so that's how I got started on that, and up until then I'd worked on solid mechanics, a gained background in solid mechanics and optimization. And one of the things that bone remodeling then I started to read a little bit about evolutionary biology and and uh, one of the things about bones is if you look at uh, load bearing bones you find these trabeculae arranged in this nice order and and in 1800s there was a person by name Wolf who said well there must be a law governing that trabecular arrangement and it came to be known as Wolf's law and people have been since then trying to figure out the mathematical form of the Wolf's Law, and I don't think it's ended. So I was one of those guys who was looking for a mathematical form to explain the structure. 
So that was what I did. So I formulated the problem as a, a constrained variational problem. And it was a Pareto optimal problem. It was inspired heavily by two people. One was McNeil Alexander, a biologist. And it's basically a trade-off between mass and the amount of energy stored. So the optimal structure must be a trade-off between the two because if the mass was very large, then the body is spending a lot of metabolic, it's expending a lot of metabolic cost to build bone mass if it's not serving a purpose, if it's to prevent risk of failure. And if it is too thin, if it has high risk of failure, then evolutionary biology would say we wouldn't exist. We would have been eaten up a long time ago because your bones would have been broken. So that was the idea here. And it turned out I used some relationship for modulus to apparent density because by developed by Carter and Hayes in 1977. And so that's how I post the problem. And this was inspired by two people. One was this book by McNeil Alexander who went on to become very famous for other robotics researchers as well because he had models for motion, locomotion that was quite heavily used in robotics as well. But he wrote this beautiful book, very thin book, very succinct. It was a delight for me, someone who hated biology to read this book called Optima for Animals where he modeled behavior, he modeled structure and energy consumption, etc., as optimization problems. And uh, the other person who influenced me was someone who worked on multi-criteria optimization, Wolfram Stadler. I didn't mention him here, I didn't cite him here, but he was another person who influenced my way of modeling here. So then I tried to discretize this problem using finite elements and solve this. And I found that if I want to solve this optimization problem, a single iterate, my optimization took 16 hours on an IBM 9370 main mainframe, which I had access to at that time. And that was not going to work. If it is single iteration, it's going to take 16 hours. I was not going to graduate anytime soon. So I had to find another way to do that. So and then I started to look in a little bit more. And I found that there was uh, variation sensitivity analysis. One could take complex functionals and determine the sensitivity on a fixed domain. So I said, instead of solving this problem as one where these boundaries also could vary, which in reality, bone boundaries could vary, I'll keep a fixed domain but vary density inside. So that way I reduce the complexity of the problem. That's what I chose to do. And that was the sensitivity. And these epsilon a, epsilon a zero are adjoint quantities that are obtained by solving an adjoint boundary value problem. And epsilon a zero is related to your objective. It really is a coupling between the original objective and the principle of virtual work. That's really where it comes from. And you do that, and then I found out that I can implement this in a problem independent manner within a finite element code if the user provided three functions. How to evaluate psi, how to evaluate the derivatives of psi with respect to behavioral quantities, how to evaluate derivatives with respect to design quantities, in this case density. If I did this, then I can solve this problem in a problem independent manner. For any new problem, whatever be the objective, if the user provided this, I could do automatically sensitivity calculation. I did that, and then it turned out when I implemented that, the single iteration was three and a half minutes. I had the possibility of graduating. <laughs> now I could. Um, so and that I didn't know at that time. This I had solved by 88 or 89. I, think I didn't know at this time that this sort of a problem is called topology optimization. And this was something that was coined. This was coined later. The, and this relationship is called SIMP solid isometric, isoparam, isometric material, isotropic material with parameterization, as it's called. And this was a term that is used commonly in topology optimization literature. This relationship is used. And this was coined in 1993. And I had used the relationship from four bones developed by Carton, Carter and Hayes in 1977. And uh, this person wrote a book on it. And he gets credit for doing the simp work. And he's got about 5,000 citations. And I have zero, <laughs> so that's that's uh, that's so that was my experience. I graduated, and I had two choices. One was to do a postdoc with a computer science professor who was my uh, committee, who was on my committee, trying to implement parallel nonlinear programming algorithms, or the other was to go work at IBM. IBM paid a little bit more; it seemed more engineering, so I decided to go to IBM. So, and uh, I went to work 
at IndyCart New York, and where IBM actually started in early 1930s, building small machines which uh, punched holes in paper tapes, <laughs> things like that, business machines. And the person who interviewed me and hired me into IBM was Bill Chen. And Bill Chen is a Cornell alum, so he was charged with the responsibility of interviewing Cornell students. And, and Professor Samakia was the manager for whom I worked. He interviewed me later and accepted me into his department. And Professor Samakia, Bill Chen, and I have continued to have a wonderful mentoring, mentor mentee relationship over all these years. Professor Samakia right now just became the president of SUNY Polytechnic. Uh, so, um, and these are all colleagues with whom I had a great deal of interaction. They helped me a great deal to adapt to industry. Dave Light, in particular, was the first person to whom my manager assigned me to do a project. And uh, Dave's, uh, Dave has a background in marine biology. I was leading a project building a supercomputer circuit board. And uh, so the first meeting, he, they had some problem with lamination. Things wouldn't line up. They were trying to get tolerances, which are very, very tight. Things wouldn't line up. So I went to the first meeting. I said, I'll do the modeling. The next meeting, I went, and Dave said, do you have the model done? And can you tell me what's going on? That was my shock. That was my uh, first introduction to industry and where I understood how things worked in industry. It's not the model that's important. What you deliver is more important. <laughs> the model is. Uh, so that was, and then Deyang and I worked on a lot of portfolio projects. Josh Thiel was a kindred spirit, and he's one uh, who relied on Mathematica more than finite element analysis. He's a TNAM student from Urbana-Champaign. So it was a great environment. So what I want to illustrate by this is people who keep you honest, and people who help you solve problems, and people who keep you intellectually stimulated in an industry environment. You need to have colleagues like that. That's what I got from that. And one other colleague of mine and in the same department with whom I used to have a lot of mechanics conversation, he's a fraction mechanics guy, was Dr. Tian Wu. And years later, he went on. He's now the chief operating officer of ASC Group, and which is a $9 billion company. So. It's not often that one has colleagues with whom you worked who now head a $9 billion company. And the lab where I worked, it no longer has an IBM logo. It was sold. IBM has moved out of hardware business. IBM is focusing more on software services. So it's a sad story. OK. So my first academic job was I moved from Endicott, New York, to Boulder. And again, another spectacular place. Notice all the pictures are in fall with spectacular fall colors. <laughs> Ithaca is the same. So 180 days, it's cloudy and gray. But the pictures are always taken in fall. <laughs> so, uh, but the boulder does remain sunny and bright 300 days in a year. So it's very beautiful. Um, Shufan can tell you. <laughs> Except the engineering building. I don't know why, but they always think engineering engineers don't like aesthetics. They like drab-looking, functional-looking buildings. So that's why the engineering building looks like that. Um, and this is the view of Continental Divide that I took when I climbed up this front range one day. <laughs> Spectacular. Those are all 11, 12,000 feet peaks. So it was a great place. I was very fortunate to have a chance to um, begin my academic career there. And I've been really fortunate to work with exceptional students. I've been privileged to work with exceptional students. And um, the way it was worked for me in my academic career is that usually students teach me. I learn from my students, and I have curiosity. I learn from my students. They teach me, and then I claim I know that stuff. <laughs> so that's how usually it works. And I've had a chance to work with many of them. And all the first seven graduated from University of Colorado. Xu Feng was my first student at Purdue. And I was very pleasantly surprised when Xu Feng said he would attend the talk. He's at GE in Cincinnati. He's here. So I'm really delighted that he could make it all the way from Cincinnati to here. So thank you for coming. Um, so and these uh, from here, Xu Feng on, they all graduated from Purdue. And, uh, and there are many who are here as well. And I want to thank them all for coming as well. They had a choice of not coming. <laughs> and most of my students have gone on to work at these places. 
And many of them were supported by Semiconductor Research Corporation, which is a consortium of these companies. And so usually, the way it works, worked for them, is by third or fourth year, they have an offer. They don't want to think about any other opportunities. They want to go on to industry. They don't want to fight tenure. They don't want to go to tenure. So that's how it's worked for my students. OK, and I've had several MS advices as well. And I'm very happy that some of them are here as well. So. OK, and I didn't do it all by myself. Several colleagues have helped me over the years. And I've also listed in chronological order and the students that they helped I co advise as well. OK, so let me just real quickly, as you'll notice, I tell long stories. So well, let me real quickly go over some of the research that I've had a chance to do over my career. I'll start with this problem, because it's a very interesting problem. It's basically, when I moved to Boulder, the IBM printing division moved to Boulder as well. And Dr. Jack Zabel was now suddenly um, given the charge of finding a way to match color for a room size printer that IBM bought from a company in Belgium called Zycon and rebranding and marketing it as an IBM printer. And so, and here's a person, who's a Purdue grad, Herrick Lab grad, used to um, printing technology that's based on um, the dot matrix printer type printing technology where you are used to vibration and now all of a sudden you are in electrophotographic printing, color printing, and everything is new. So what color printing is all about is I have an image on my screen, I want to print it on my printer, and I want to make sure that the image on the screen is produced as accurately as possible on my printer. The problem with that is image on the screen, this is a color space as it's called. It's a device independent color space. X, Y is just a generic coordinates. And what you're seeing here is a spectral locus of the colors that human eye can perceive starting with blue here, deep blue here, all the way to red here. It's actually a circle like this. It goes like that. And green, greenish yellow is here. That's the brightest color that human eye can perceive. And the monitors have additive color production scheme. That's why they look triangular, blue, green, and red here. Whereas the printers subtractively produce color. They filter. Cyan is a red filter, for instance. Cyan is a red filter, and similarly, um, yellow is a blue filter and so on. So therefore, the printer gamut, as it's called, the range of colors the printer can produce is very different from the range of colors the monitor can produce. So if I'm given a color point here, what is the nearest color point in the printer space? That's really the gamut mapping problem. So what we did was, and again, there's a connection to geometry to almost everything that I'm going to talk about today. So what we did was to pose this as a Pareto optimal problem. You also notice that I like Pareto optimal formulations. So we posted it as a Pareto optimal problem where we can optimize either the color accuracy or the amount of ink used. And then the way you characterize a printer is you print a whole bunch of patches of colors like this and use a spectrophotometer to basically determine the device independent coordinates corresponding to each of these patches. These are points in a color space. Now you have a bunch of data points. What do you do with those data points? We said, let's use the q hull algorithm from the Geometry Center in Minnesota to fit a tetrahedral mesh to it. Now I can do interpolation, and I can also take the same data points, train them through an artificial neural network. Now I have two ways to match the CMYK to an LAB that comes from the image. LAB is a device independent space. We did this, and we published it in ACM Transactions and Graphics. Here's another thing. We wrote a 43-page 40, paper. And I tell a long story. <laughs> so, and here are some examples. So here is the, en the error minimization when you limit the amount of ink to four, ink fraction to four, which means you can put any amount of ink you like. This is when you limit it to one and a half, ink fraction to one and a half. Cyan is one, magenta is one, yellow is one, black is one. So one and a half means you only allow a total of one and a half. And you see that it's reasonable for the lot less ink that you're spending here. And here, these are problems where you're minimizing ink with an allowable error on color. So it's a very different physics, but the same computational techniques can be applied to the same problem. And it turns out there are some challenges with the number of 
printing points that you, you print. Normal tendency would be to print seven by seven by seven patches, which is an awful lot of patches that you're characterizing with a spectrophotometer, especially if it's a grad student putting a photometer on the patch and looking at his LAV value. So we found that we could do that with 149. That's all required. Then Professor Herleman was the one who hired me. I saw him at a couple of conferences before I came to Purdue. I got to know him briefly because he had also worked on SRC-related projects. And I was delighted to have the opportunity to come to Purdue. So we left with our kids. Uh, and we left the opportunity to hike in Rocky Mountain National Park, camp at Mesa Verde. And instead, we exchanged it for the opportunity to go to world-class museums in Chicago and excellent schooling. Our kids have made the best use of and an occasional trip back to Colorado. So, so that's what we've done. And at that same time, I also was uh, given a new professional service role, given an opportunity to serve on a new professional uh, service role, which was to serve as editor-in-chief of IEEE Transactions and Advanced Packaging. I was entrusted that responsibility by Paul Wessling, who was the VP for IEEE CPMT Society. I'm grateful to him for trusting me with that responsibility. So this journal uh, ranked um, by impact factor second in 2003 among all manufacturing related journals and third in 2005 along among all manufacturing related journals. Okay, so let me go on to talk about my research. I'm gonna divide it into parts here. I'm gonna start with CAD CAE integration. This is most of this work happened at Purdue, although it started a little bit earlier. Some of it started a little bit earlier. So when I worked in industry, my management didn't care what method I used to solve a problem as long as the problem was solved. Now I came to academia, I didn't publish a lot of papers out of my PhD work. In fact, I had zero journal papers out of my PhD work because my advisor didn't think important. it was important. I didn't think it was important because I was going to go to industry. But I came to academia and all of a sudden there was this thing called tenure, so I needed to figure out I needed to write papers. So in industry, I didn't care what method I used as long as I solved the problem, but in academia, I found out what problem you solve is not important, but the method is more important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here I was chasing a problem. I had seen this droplet shape, constrained droplet shape problem between circular pads solved by a colleague in IBM for a real application. And I said, let me make the problem more interesting. Let me make it with square pads square pads, twisted and offset, and I want to find the droplet shape. Now, that's a three-dimensional shape. It's a nice shape optimal design problem, so it met a lot of criteria. So I said, okay, uh, let me formulate this problem in a different coordinate system, not a cylindrical coordinate system because the pads are offset and twisted, so I can't use cylindrical coordinate system. So let me use an off-centered coordinate system with a centroidal locus that I track and I describe positions on the surface and I came up with this formulation. I discretized it, solved, optimized, discretized it, optimized the location of each of these nodes using an optimization algorithm. And then I got the shape, and then I automated the transfer of that. I created a three-dimensional mesh automatically because now I had centroidal locus. So I could construct this three-dimensional mesh. I could transfer it to Abacus, do elastic plastic creep analysis, try to predict fatigue life. So that's what I had done. And I wrote a paper. I was, it's a single, those days I had to write papers by myself. In fact, a uh, little bit of a story. My advisor came to visit me. My doctoral advisor came to visit me when I joined Colorado. And I was whining about how I was not able to find students. And he said, um, well, it's always a good idea to do it on your own <laughs> initially. <laughs> so that's when I got started to do this on my own. And that helped me. That was a great advice. So, and then, I, you know, this seemed like there are about hundreds of nodes here that I'm optimizing. It seemed like a very wasteful optimization problem. Why do I have to optimize hundreds of unknowns for a shape that I know is smooth? So why can't I exploit the smoothness and reduce the number of optimization problems, optimization unknowns? And I knew from optimal design literature that if you use nodal uh, positions as unknowns, you could end up with non-smooth boundaries, poor matrix conditioning, 
And there was some work in 1984 which basically had used what they called as design elements, where they used B-spline patches, which would, be, would, which would be optimized, and then the B-spline patches would be in turn parameshed automatically at each iteration. So that was work by Brybunk and Flutie from 1984. I said, well, let's not, wh why not we do the same thing? And instead of using finite elements as uh, nodes as positions, why not use nerves themselves directly and optimize the uh, unknowns on the nerves? And there are far fewer unknowns to describe the smooth shape compared to the mesh. And that we published uh, nerve space solutions in computer methods and applied mechanics and engineering. It's probably one of the earliest works in terms of using nerves directly for analysis. Now, nerves are spline geometries. I'm going to skip this. They are spline geometries. And they have many properties that are actually as good, if not better, than finite element shape functions as interpolants. So that area in 2005 became a field of its own. It's called isogeometric analysis, use of NURBS for analysis. Use of geometric models directly for analysis became a field of its own called isogeometric analysis. And there are whole conferences dedicated to that topic each year, thanks to this person, Tom Hughes. So now there are two ways you can represent geometry in CAD. One is called CSG, and the other is a BREP model. In CSG, you start with predefined primitives, where it's very easy to tell if a point is inside or outside, these predefined simple primitives can tell if a point is inside or outside. And you compose them, Boolean compose them. You define a procedure to define a final geometry. You actually don't construct a final geometry unless absolutely necessary, but you have a procedure. It's sort of like a recipe. This is how you cook your final dish, but you don't actually cook it until necessary. So that's a CSG procedure. But unfortunately, if you have complex shapes like this, CSG, you need to have primitives that look like that as well. So CSG is not very useful when you have sculpted surfaces, complex surfaces. So BREP, you have an explicit boundary. You trim these boundaries. You stitch them together to construct the final shape. So you have a boundary that is well defined, but you don't have any points inside. Here you have points inside that you can tell whether it's inside or outside, but you don't have a boundary. So that's the trade-off that you have. So what we did was we tried CSG was was actually uh, was created by one of my professors prior to him coming to Cornell, Herb Walker. He, I had him in a class, so I knew him as the founder of solid, solid modeling. And he had a pure CSG CAD system as well called Paddle. Nowadays, most CAD systems are not pure CSG or BREP. They are kind of hybrid in between. So we said, well, now in CSG relies on point sets. Why can't I describe within each of these primitives a functional approximation. Now in function space, I compose these approximations as opposed to thinking of point sets, compositions in point set, point, composition of point sets. And these function space for these approximations to converge, they need to obey a property called partition of unity. And then we wrote a paper on how to construct these partitions of unity. These are some of this work is actually started with uh, Devin Natekar and Shufang was instrumental in doing some of this work. And this is an application. So that was the basic idea of uh, and what CSG now requires is that I need to have trivariate, a functional representation that relies on three parameters. Most CAT systems don't provide you a functional representation based on three parameters. They only give you a functional surface representation. Surface the skin, not the solid itself. So you only have a two-parameter entity, not two-parameter surface, not a three-parameter solid. So we said, well, one thing we could do is we could try to construct a trivariate solid modeler. Since CSG is a procedural description, what we could do is we could symbolically construct a computer algebra for CAD as opposed to one where you interact with a mouse on a com computer screen. You could symbolically describe it because it's all purely procedural. It follows set theoretic logic. So I can write a symbolic CAD system. And that's what Ole Morgan's thesis was. 
And so we wrote a symbolic patch system. We called it high jump. And unfortunately, this patch system is not quite commercial. It was developed in the univers university, but however, the idea exists. So now we can use this sort of a CSG modeler to do analysis directly. So now supposing I have a plate with a hole and I want to find the optimal orientation. Okay, this might look familiar to Shufan. So, so this is a plate with a hole. We want to find the optimal orientation. I don't, each time the whole orientation changes, I don't have to reconstruct the mesh. I can think of this hole as a composition on the underlying domain of the plate. So I have a composition, I have, I have an approximation corresponding to the plate. I have an approximation corresponding to the hole. And I can do a Boolean composition of functional approximations corresponding to the two to describe the approximation corresponding to the plate with the hole. Then I can move the location of the hole and optimize the location of the hole. During the entire process, I don't have to remesh. I'm only studying the interaction. Then we can take this further. You can ask the question, what if I have, in addition to the plate and the hole, I also have material distribution that I need to change around. Turns out this problem was motivated by a biological problem that I had looked at a long time ago. Turned out in 1972, there was a person by the name Al Burstein in Cleveland who had done an experiment on rabbit femur. That was a time when people were doing fracture fixation by drilling holes in bones. And the fear was for engineers is anytime you see a hole, you worry about stress concentration. So by putting a hole in a bone, do you weaken the bone for fracture fixation? So he did a beautiful experiment I, it was on rabbits, unfortunately, and that part was not beautiful, but everything else was. Um, so the experiment, what he did was he drilled holes in one, one thigh of the rabbit, and in one he put uh, basically allowed the bone to fill in. In another set, he put a soft rubber plug, and a third set he put screws in. And after eight weeks, he twisted them all and found that they all took the same energy as the control femurs. So in other words, bone adapted no matter whether you allow the hole to fill or hole to remain. And the way it adapted was if you allow the hole to fill, it will fill the hole. If you put a soft plug in, it basically make the bone around the hole denser. And that's really the problem that we modeled here. And this sort of problem, computationally modeling, was not very easy to do at the time we did this. I still believe it's a challenging problem because now you have to change the uh, shape of this hole as you're optimizing the hole orientation. You also have to simultaneously change the density around. Okay, here's another application. Here's another application of this sort of a computational approach. So this is from uh, microelectronics industry. In chips, there is something called a thermal interface material that's between the heat spreader and the die. The thermal interface material looks like this. It's usually particle filled composite, usually uh, the, the material, the matrix material is either epoxy or silicon. It has very low conductivity, the matrix usually of the order of 0.2, 0.3 watts per meter Kelvin. The particle is alumina, boron, nitride, sometimes even metals, silver, and they have very high conductivity, anywhere between 25 to 200 to 400. And what GE was trying to do, this was a joint project with GE. GE had a large grant from Department of Commerce, and I was doing the modeling work. We were doing the modeling work. So what GE was trying to do was to determine the particle size distribution, and they wanted to know, given a particle size distribution, what is the effective thermal conductivity of the composite. And you do experiments at various volume fractions of this particulate system, volume fraction being a surrogate for all the particle size distribution, what you find is the effective conductivity that you get up to about 30% matches the classical Maxwell's model or uh, the Rayleigh expression or the, the hashin strickman bounds. All of that will match OK until about 30%. But beyond 30%, they don't match very well. So the normal question is, is it because of spatial arrangement of particles or interface? And most <laughs> often, people would say, well, you know, the experiments don't match the model. The model must not be correct. Therefore, the interface is probably imperfect. <laughs> so I felt that maybe we should explore the particle arrangement and the physics of energy transport between particles a little bit more. And so what we did was, and this is Shufeng's work again, 
So what we did was we took uh, particle arrangements, same volume fraction but the number of particles much smaller, simulated the effective conductivity and what we find is that in all cases we matched right on top and this is not one simple simulation, there were 30 such simulations. It's really the average, statistical average of 30 such simulations. The experiments themselves are 15 such experiments. Each of those is 15 such experiments. And what you find is match. What, what you see is really the physics is basically near percolation energy transport in this particle fill systems, which the simulation was able to capture quite well. And okay, so that's an application. And the reason why we needed this computational procedure is because when I'm rearranging these particle arrangements 30 times, I don't want to remesh every time. So we were doing it more or less automatically. That was also the time around early 2000 when everybody had jumped into nano. I jumped into nano as well. So we did size dependent conductivity estimation for these silica particles and uh, published it in uh, physical review and we moved on nanoparticles, nanowires, nanofilms. We estimated the pizza resistance. There was actually a student's PhD thesis. We moved on. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that we've done in the last few years. Now, one of my uh, goals is, let's say I have a BRAP geometry. The BRAP geometry, the disadvantage of BRAP geometry, boundary representation, or an explicit geometry representation for an interface or a boundary, is that any topological change is very hard to model with an explicit boundary representation. Whereas application of boundary conditions is a lot easier if I have an explicit boundary condition. And with an implicit geometry, as you will see, and these are all examples of problems with evolving boundaries, cracks, solidification, intermetallic growth, shape optimal design, these are all examples of problems with uh, evolving boundaries. So normally, when you use BRAP models, what you would have to do is to start with a skin, mesh the interior, do and do the analysis. Now, meshing is not always easy if your parts are very intricate and they have thin parts. It's very hard to mesh thin parts. So now, what I could do is to immerse these surfaces inside a domain and then somehow analyze it. Now, how do we do this is the question. I want to preserve the geometric exactness of my BRAP model. I want to immerse it in a domain and do the analysis at no point sacrificing my geometric exactness. And so the question, there are two choices when you do that. One is you can keep the boundary ex, uh, implicit, meaning that I take away the boundary, understand its influence on the background. Okay, that's the implicitized boundary. Or I could keep the boundary explicit. The advantage of explicit boundary is at any point I know curvatures, normals, etc., which I need for any physics, complex physics. I know the ex curvature and normals, etc. Implicitized, my governing equation is complex. I don't have curvatures and normals until I refine it. Only in the limit of refinement I know the curvatures and normals. And boundary conditions are difficult to impose as well. And you have on top of that large degrees of freedom that you need to track, which tells you whether your point is on one side of the boundary or on the other side. Given a point, I can only sell, tell whether it is on one side of the boundary or on the other side. I don't quite know where the boundary is. I don't have an explicit description of the boundary. Whereas with an explicit boundary, I have simpler governing equation. This is a certification problem, Stefan problem. I have a simpler governing equation. Geometric quantities are directly computed. Curvatures and normals are explicitly known. And I can impose boundary conditions directly and I can also achieve higher continuity of the interface. So, so what we have attempted to do was to construct explicit immersed boundary and solve a variety of problems. That's what we've done over the last few years. There are two issues when you do this explicit immersed boundary. First issue is you need to know what is the distance of influence this interface that you put in typically has physics associated with it, that physics dies as a function of distance. So you need to have a measure of distance from that surface. Those are all CAD issues that come about. And you also need to know, given a point, what is the nearest point on the interface that it influences? So that's called point projection. So you need to know something about distance and you need to, know, you need to be able to project a point onto the surface. Both of these you need to be able to solve. Um, now, if I want to do distance, the natural 
temptation would be to go with an iterative scheme like Newton-Raphson scheme. And if you do that, there are problems with Newton-Raphson scheme. If I have a sharp curvature, the parameter value that you map to from any point, let's say you are going along the line and you're asking the question, what is the closest point on the interface? The point to which you map with Newton-Raphson could be sometime here or here if you have a sharp curvature. So Newton-Raphson is non-robust. It's not very good. And it's, it could be also discontinuous. For instance, if I'm anywhere here, I cannot reach any point on this surface. So Newton-Raphson has problems of both non-existent and it could also be uh, in, incorrect. It could be non-smooth. So you could use linearized geometry but there are problems with that. If you're not preserving the geometry, I can linearize to calculate distance. That's simpler computationally, but there are problems with that. So we developed an algebraic procedure based on algebraic geometry principles to construct a measure of distance. These work like level sets, but except they're algebraic level sets, they work ex from an exact, meaning NURBS, ex exact NURBS boundary. And uh, publish the work. And you can then get distance measures for any complex surfaces and they are robust compared to Newton-Raphson method. So here is point projection. Same idea can be used for point projection as well. So Newton-Raphson would never be able to reach these points. It jumps between this point and this point, whereas the algebraic procedure does well. And here are some oscillations that you would have with Newton-Raphson. No problem with the algebraic procedure that we develop, algebraic level sets that we develop. OK, so here is an example, Stefan problem, classical problem. So now we have enrichments corresponding to the interface. That is the interface between the solid, the two phases, solid and liquid phase. And these enrichments are both on the temperature field as well as the gradient in temperature field because the gradient jump is the one that drives the interface to move. And now we can enforce explicitly the Gibbs-Thomson condition, temperature condition based on curvature, temperature condition based on velocity. And here is a solution for that. And this is uh, dendritics. Um, Stefan's dendritic solidification. So you start with a circular, initially circular solid placed at initial at this location here, and it's initially supercooled. You heat, and immediately the, from the corner you start to create these solidification fronts, which we can model explicitly. Now all of these boundaries were modeled explicitly. Now when you go through at every iteration, you need to determine whether your boundary needs to be uh, coarsened or it needs to be uh, refined. So you need to do both of them. All of those are included in this. And that's all there in the publication that I list here. All these details are there. OK, so now I'm going to switch to another application. So I've talked about solidification. Again, the basic idea is the same. I want to keep track of an explicit boundary. I have some measure of distance from the boundary, an algebraic level set that I compute without any iteration, no Newton-Raphson iteration. I preserve the ex exactness of the boundary and I'm able to project from any point onto the boundary. So I keep all those algebraic geometry ideas. So now I'm going to uh, looking at a different class of problem, crack problem. So these kinds of problems are very common in electronics. Here I have a sharp corner, and here I have a crack. Now, there is special behavior associated with sharp corners and cracks. Elasticity theory tells us the sharp corner is going to be a point of singular stress. Crack, I have discontinuity across the crack a jump in displacement across the crack, and I have singular stresses at the crack tip as well. That's what elasticity tells me. And they all are of the form 1 over r to the power lambda. That's the nature of singularity at the sharp corner as well as the crack tip. Lambda is 1 half in the case of a crack tip. And in the case of a sharp corner, it could be any, any value in that range. So what we would like to do is to analyze these kinds of problems Taking a geometric view, I think of this curve, the crack, as a, a lower dimensional, a one parameter entity in 2D, embedded in an underlying domain. I can now compute from this crack with measure of distance. I can say how far this crack's influence will go. I can measure an influence from the crack tip, the singularity. I can enrich my underlying field with known behaviors at the crack or at the crack tip. I can do all of that. And then I can, these are the um, formulation of the problem. Here is the enrichment idea of the displacement field. Continuous displacement, displacement jump, jump across a crack face, tip asymptotic displacement. And here is 
a simulation of that. And there's a fair amount of implementation that I'm not going through here. And there's a fairly large Fortran code underlying all of this simulation. So here's an example of crack. This is the one Mises stress. All simulated, done without, uh, strictly as a composition of a field associated with the crack with the underlying field has a composition of the two. And here you can apply that to problems of this nature, practical problems of this nature. And we've actually applied that same idea. Now we can ask the question, if I have a crack that is obliquely incident on an interface, does it turn into the interface or does it cross the interface? And the answer depends on what is the strength of the interface relative to the, the in toughness of the material, homogeneous material. The answer depends on that. And depending on the toughness ratio of the interface to the homogeneous material, we've been able to automatically propagate the cracks. These kinds of simulations are hard to do with commercial codes. I don't know of any that has existed with using commercial codes. So we can do that in two ways. Here, crack represents a displacement jump. In the right-hand side, crack is really a more model like a damage. So crack represents a region of zero stiffness, material with zero stiffness, zero modulus. So you can model it both ways. And these are practical problems. These kinds of cracks come about quite a bit in electronics, as I'll show you next. So here, I'm going to, again, focus on electronics. This is what's called the back end of a die, back end of a chip. And this is about three to four microns. And underneath this is about 500 microns of silicon. So this is the top few microns where all the action is, where all the circuitry is. And what you're trying to do, the electronics industry is trying to do, is to make these dielectric more and more porous. So the dielectric constant is closer to that of air, so you can send your signals faster. That's really what electronics industry is trying to do. But when you make it porous, you make it more susceptible to fracture during processing and during use. And one of those fractures occurs at the first layer between multiple materials, and I'll talk about that in a second. There is other problem. The other problem is these corners are positions of singularities, and they have singularities of this nature. And often, there's not just a single dominant singularity, but there are multiple singularities, it turns out, in these corners. And to analyze them, you need it's really a, a, an eigenvalue problem. The solution to that eigenvalue problem gives you the strengths of singularities. So given a material set, given the back end of a die with varying signal line architecture that you can put in, you can typically, in a, in a typical semiconductor technology of today, you can find several locations which are potentially susceptible for high stress, stress concentrations, singular stresses. There are seven or eight of them here. There are eight of them here. And the question is, which of these is most susceptible for crack initiation? And when you do the asymptotic analysis, you find that s materials, when you have a s less stiff material surrounded by, in, in 270 degrees by a stiff material, then those corners are a lot more susceptible and the strength of singularity could be as high as 0.45 for the current generation of technology. Now, as you make it more and more porous, when the strength of singularity becomes 0.5, essentially what you have is even though you have a 90 degree angle, you have created a crack if the strength of singularity is one half. So essentially that has the same behavior as a crack. So we analyzed it and we found this seven to be the location potentially where crack could start. And there was a situation that we were trying to analyze. So given three material sets, industry wants to go to this material set. They are at this material set. They were at this material set. And when you go to this, the question is, where would the crack initiate? How would the crack propagate? And here is a simulation of damage. What you see is those corners at the interface between the oxide and the ultra low K dielectric is what the simulation says would be potential location where the cracks would initiate. Now, in order to do these simulations, every interface is modeled as an enrichment. Every interface has a geometry associated with it and an enrichment associated with it, enriched field associated with it. And you initiate a crack based on a damage law, and that crack propagates automatically. All of that is modeled here. And the industry also typically wants to know at what process step do these cracks originate. Remember, these are four microns. You have no way to know them by observation. You can only do them post-mortem. You can only cross-section after assembly. So we can track the process steps 
and we can predict at what process step this crack would initiate. You can see the damage is maximum after what's called the reflow step, which is cooled on after the solder joints are bonded onto the circuit. Solder joint between the chip and the board are bonded. Okay, so one more problem. Um, so another question that we asked ourselves a few years ago is, supposing I were to have a structure and I want to insert a stiffener, or I want to put a hole, where should I put the hole? Or where should I put the stiffener? Can I find sensitivity to moving this hole or stiffener? And it turns out that question is not a trivial question. It's a very difficult question to answer. If I put uh, a stiffening uh, inclusion here, what is the location, orientation of that inclusion, and how should I change the shape of that inclusion? That's a difficult question to answer. So we posed what's called a configurational optimization problem. It's a trade-off optimization problem, where you're given an arbitrary objective and mass. You can form a weighted combination, which basically is a trade-off between the two. This arbitrary objective is relative to a homogeneous material. F0 corresponds to homogeneous material. M0 is a homogeneous material. Now I put in either a soft or a stiff inclusion. Soft inclusion with density lower than the surrounding. Stiff, stiff inclusion with density greater than the surrounding. I put in a soft or stiff inclusion. I post this optimization problem where I want to minimize some objective, arbitrary objective subject to principle of virtual work, which I need to satisfy. And I ask the question, what is the change in the objective due to change in boundary of either the inclusion or the outside boundary? So that you can derive. It's a very long expression. But it turns out it's not important for us to look at this big expression. But this v here is the velocity with which the domain is changing, the velocity at every point inside the domain. And I do that. And then I simplify this arbitrary design velocity. And this quantity here comes about in quite a bit. Anytime you have an inclusion, that's the configurational tensor. And then you can ask the question, what if my velocity were either a translation, rotation, or scaling? And that reduces the problem quite a bit. And you get these forms of sensitivity to arbitrary translations, to arbitrary rotations, or to arbitrary scaling of any arbitrary objective. And if you have your inclusion where to be a crack, these three quantities will turn out to be the J, L, and M integrals. It turns out it's a generalization of the idea of J, L, and M integrals. You do that. Now I can put an arbitrary heterogeneity into my domain and use these sensitivities to move them. And what you're seeing here is the optimal location of a hole on a structure with this parabolic loading. And in each iteration, I compute the sensitivity and I move it. And again, this is again a moving boundary problem, like the one that I mentioned. And I can do that with a crack in the presence of a crack as well. And this is the move motion of a hole in the presence of a crack, or an inclusion in the presence of the crack. Now, we can also do the reverse. We can keep the inclusion fixed and move the crack, and ask the question, where is the crack likely to cause the most damage, or least damage? We could answer that question as well with the sensitivity that we have here. And this is the more complicated implementation, three-dimensional. OK. Um, I have a couple of uh, a few more non-geometry-oriented, mechanics-oriented problem. I'm almost out of time here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to spend maybe five minutes, talk very briefly about the kinds of problems that we've had a chance to work on. And this was the PhD work of Sanjay Goel. So we were looking at metal film buckling and so, for instance, if we fabricate aluminum line on a very weakly bonded substrate, SU8 substrate, and you heat it up, the aluminum film, it turns out, will buckle. And then it can, if you heat it further, it will start to propagate in. Now, you can use this phenomena to extract back the fit fracture toughness of the interface between the aluminum film and the substrate. And that's what we did here. We had to develop the theory for how buckling would induce debonding. So we had to develop a theory for that. And we had to develop a model for that. And we actually used that to extract back the fracture toughness. But it turns out when you buckle these metals, the metals actually undergo plastic deformation. If you don't account for plasticity, you can't extract fracture toughness accurately. You would overestimate the fracture toughness, it turns out. So and by accounting for the plasticity, you estimate fracture toughness. This was the thesis work of San, Sanjay Goel. 
And this is the work of uh, Anirudh, who is here. So recently, more recently, uh, we looked at dynamics and stability of reactive interfaces. Again, an interface is very common in electronics as well. So what you're seeing here is an intermetallic. It's the copper tin intermetallic, Cu6, SN5. And that usually initially forms as a scallop. After, the, after it's solidified and after a while it flattens out. The question is what causes it to flatten out? What causes the scallop shape in the first place? That's the question that we were trying to address. Because any intermetallic in electronics is not very good because it's brittle, it fractures. It makes your electronic part more susceptible to failure. So we developed a model for the interfacial velocity, which basically has copper here at the bottom, which comes from the copper pad. The copper diffuses, this is the copper pad, copper diffuses through the intermetallic, comes to the interface, reacts with the tin, which is in the molten state, forming Cu6SN5. And then that Cu6SN5 diffuses along the interface. And now, depending on the rate at which the reaction occurs relative to the rate at which the diffusion occurs, you could either have a flat surface or you could have a scalloped surface. This is what we model. This is a phase field model, by the way. It's not the computational approach that we developed before because I was not quite ready for this problem. We are working on it right now. So we have uh, these are the governing equations. I'm going to skip through this. And this is the interfacial simulation. What you're seeing here, the color code is really the concentration of copper. OK. And I'm going to skip through this. Now we can also study the stability of the interface. You can ask the question, there is a stability parameter that determines whether this interface will scallop or will flatten. So we have situation where this interfacial parameter, this lambda relates to reaction rate. This is the diffusion along the interface. So depending on the value, if this will scallop. And here, oops, OK, this is not working. And so if I have a rough surface and I have some wavelengths would flatten, some wavelengths would scallop, and eventually you'll get a stable scalloped interface that explains what we see experimentally when we look at the cross sections of these solder joints. OK, last, maybe I'll take two minutes to explain this, and then I'm done. <laughs> so we've also looked at fatigue over the last several years, specifically in solder. In general, it's uh, the approaches to modeling fatigue are mostly empirical, Coffin-Manson rule. So you're based on an intact material. You predict how long it'll last. You don't actually follow the process of failure. So here, what we tried to do was to ask the question, what if I had a simple failure description, a damage description at every material point, and track the locus of points which have critical damage value. And then we did experiments as well. These are experiments as well. And we tracked crack funds over a period of time. And what you're seeing here is a simple viable description of material failure, accumulated damage, and the crack front that is predicted. Now, Interestingly, it turns out the model predicts that after a while, after the crack has gone through a certain distance, it will actually undergo exponential growth and damage, and it will zip through. And you see that in the morphology of the fractured surface as well. You eventually, when you start bending things back and forth, eventually they become very easy. And it, in the same way, in these joints are sh fractured in shear. Eventually, you'll have shear overload, and the crack would just zip through. And you see that in the model as well. So the question is, which comes first, the microstructure or the stress, geometry and stress? In this particular case, geometry and stress dictate it more than the microstructure. Microstructure follows the geometry and stress. And so what we said as well, the Bible description is OK. It's interesting that it provides us uh, results that are matching very well with experiments. but. It's not physically intuitive. So maybe we should develop some theory. So we went through and went through a process of developing a theory. We said, let's use max entropy principle, develop the theory, and then we can predict, we can model damage as a cumulative failure distribution corresponding to a max entropy distribution. And then uh, we did experiments. Th these are, you know, in my group, most of my students build their own microscale experiments. We built a microscale mechanical tester. We take these solder joint samples that you can see here. That's the solder joint sample. There's a capacitance sensor here, which can measure displacement submicron, submicron precision, lab view controllers, precision stages, um, manual stages to reduce misalignment. 
do the cycling test and uh, measure load drop, calculate inelastic dissipation per cycle, fit to the max entropy model. The model does fit the data quite well. So that tells us it's okay. If we can extract that single parameter that this model, damage model has. There is only a single parameter here for this damage model. And then we take the damage model parameter extracted at uh, 25C and use it to predict fit to data at 125C. 125C is pretty close to melting temperature for solder. It's 0.9 or so of homologous temperature, and we still fit quite well. And then we take a real package, thermally cycle it, not mechanically cycle it, but thermally cycle it. And we track the cracked fronts. And then compare the experimentally observed cracked front path to the predicted cracked path. And we actually do quite well. And we do reasonably well as well. So, OK. So in summary, what I've tried to do was to go from a purely geometric view towards the end. I went to more and more physics. Uh, problems where physics is very important as, a, uh, as well, complex physics as well. So in many of these problems, the point that I want to make, the thesis that I want to make is if you keep in mind the geometric issues, geometry issues, they may be far, sometimes more important than the physics itself. So especially in fracture, for instance, the physics is very well known, but handling the computational geometry issues can be quite challenging. So having a geometric, geometry centric viewpoint can be advantageous. You can preserve the exact geometry. I've tried to show you a technique by which you can preserve the exact geometry, exact to CAD, that is, exact to NURBS, that is. Um, reduce the number of unknowns, improve robustness. It's not often possible to, that you can improve all three of them at the same time. OK. And uh, you know, any career is not um, the effort of one person. Many people contribute. Students have contributed. But my move to Purdue has required sacrifice on the part of others in my family. My wife was sitting in the back. She's had to give up her career in order for us to move to Purdue. So I want to acknowledge her, her role in, in whatever I presented today as well. Thank you. Could you explain the, the NURBS reconstruction? Because I've seen it. Uh, it seemed that it was, well, in fluid dynamics, we would say TBD or monotonicity preserving um, type of rigidity. It was a very early slide where you had 1D. You have to breeze through it. Okay. That one. So NURBS is a parametric geometric model. And it can handle solutions with discontinuities? It's, a, it's a basically you can create discontinuities. It's basically a, 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 a rational polynomial. Mm -hmm. It's a rational polynomial in the representation. The way you create discontinuities is by doing what is called repeated knots. So at any given point, a knot is a point where two splines the join. Spline, spline knot, okay. Splines join. Now, if I have multiple points here, inserted points here, knot points here, it turns out I cause a discontinuity there. I reduce the continuity of my continuous curve. So it's handled naturally, so that way I can model corners. And uh, another quick question. The Boolean operation that you do that allows you, for example, to optimize the shape of a hole by linear by superposition of two problems without having to remesh the background problem is that allowed by the linearity of the problem or is that how do you so it's just uh, so let me see if I can go to that slide yeah. so this is not in any way imposing on the underlying uh, constitutive behavior of the material all I'm doing is constructing an approximation it's just in, it's basically saying that I have to construct an approximation at any point. 
I look at any point, the approximation at that, with the field value at that point is a composition of two fields, the composed quantity and the underlying entity. So that approximation at any point can then be passed through any constitutive behavior that I care for. So there is no limitation in terms of nonlinearity of the material nonlinearity or geometric nonlinearity. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's thank Professor Subarayan. Thank you. And, and please stop by and get some food. We we don't want to take that back. So.